ever heard of a wintigo? Sherry Dyer introduced me to that term this week. Sherry also, by the way, put together our beautiful images for our meditation, so thanks to Sherry for that. She also introduced me to an article in Legion magazine that explains a little bit more about this term, wendigo. Wendigo is a word that's used by the Ojibwa people, also known as the Chippewa in the U.S. And uh, in particular, Basil Johnston, who's an Ojibwa uh, member and really a scholar who's written 11 books on the First Nations, talks about this term a little bit more fully and explains what it is. He says that a Wendigo is a human whose selfishness has overpowered their self-control to the point that satisfaction is no longer possible. Wendigos are always hungry no matter how much they eat. So you get the basic idea of the Wendigo. It's really the epitome of greed, isn't it? And Basil talks about how in the last 200 years in North America, the Wendigo has expanded beyond the individual, and it can be things like multinational national corporations that devour the resources and even devour each other, much like the legendary Indian giant cannibals that were Wendigos. So the problem is that the Wendigo has become even something that's not only acceptable, but maybe even admirable in our society. This idea of amassing great amounts of wealth beyond what we could ever possibly use is really upheld as something we want to aspire to. So we want to look today at this Wendigo essence, this way of behaving, and to see where we might show up that way and how we might be able to turn the tide. We're starting a series today on the seven deadly sins. Now we know in unity that sin is an archery term and it simply means making a mistake, missing the mark in archery. So what we're talking about is transforming the seven, let's say, vices into virtues. And the first is greed, transforming greed into generosity. The others that we'll look at along the way uh, that are part of the deadly sins are things like anger and lust and envy and gluttony and sloth and pride. So have you ever noticed that your greatest strength is also sometimes your greatest area of an improvement? That the two sort of parallel one another? That's really that line that will walk during this time to be able to flip, like flipping a coin, from greed to generosity and from each of these vices into the virtue that is the flip side of the coin of each of those. And so we'll find ways that we can call forth those areas of improvement that are also natural strengths for us and buoy those up. So most of us hoard a little bit in some way, or we cling to things, or we maybe get a little greedy around certain things. We probably know what our areas are. You know, toilet paper in a pandemic, for example. So certainly we've heard a lot of stories of that being stored up by people, and then some of those folks got so much of that that they were trying to return it to the stores. And so where does that come from? You know, underpinning that is that idea that there's not enough, right? And that is the myth that sort of runs underneath greed, that more is better is one of those myths, and, and there's never enough, there's not enough. There's a lack of some kind. I know one of the areas for me is like papers and books that I tend to keep um, a lot of those things around. And I, an organizer once said, oh, that's attachment to the written word. And, and she said it so easily and effortlessly, and it just sort of, oh, yeah, that's what that's about. So now I know, okay, so that's the attachment that's there, and I can let that go. So sometimes it helps to just recognize what it is that we're sort of grasping at or holding, or what it is that we are valuing, so we can look at it and see, oh, it's okay, we can, we can let that go. There's, there's plenty more words in the universe, <laughs> and, and they will continue to flow through, right? Just like everything else, as we let go, then we open up that law of circulation, and that's all part of generosity. And maybe it's food. I think for a lot of us, one of these areas is food. We have this survival instinct in us that says, I have to eat till I'm full. 
and 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 that instinct that that way of being is really it, it had a place at one time but for most of us that's not where we're living now I realize for some of us it is that hunger is a real issue for many of us it's not so much that there is plenty and there is an ease of, of getting plenty so so that old wiring tends to make us buy way more food than we need eat more food than we need and waste far more food than we need the FDA says that in America we waste 30 to 40 percent of our food supply that just gets dumped. And so they have actually there are several agencies that have banded together in 2019 and made a goal for 2030 that by 2030 that Americans food waste will be cut in half. And so we can do our part in that area as we look at what drives that need to feel full, what drives that need to have more and to and, and have more than we need and more than we can use and end up wasting so much. So whatever it is that we tend to store up, whatever it is that behavior that is a little greedy or clingy or hoarding, it, it's based on this, this, there's not enough. And so once we recognize that false belief that is underneath that, we can begin to shift, we can begin to transform. Many of us have more than enough and we continue to store up. But Jesus says, consider the ravens. They neither sow nor reap. They have no storehouse or barn, yet God feeds them. So how can we move toward that feeling of being free as a bird and being as confident as a raven? When I see a raven, I think of a bird that really knows itself. There's a sense of confidence in that. And so that raven knows that it will always be taken care of, that there is always plenty. It lives in a basic idea of abundance. It lives in an idea that there is plenty and perhaps even generosity, probably depends on the raven. But knowing and trusting that all of our needs are met are a key part of how we can loosen the grip on those things that we are clinging or storing up and let go and let God will always be taken care of. Do you know that the American population, the entire American population could fit in the 2.3 billion square feet of storage units that we have? That everybody could be sheltered in the storage units that we have alone. That's pretty remarkable. Like food, we have plenty of stuff to feed the world, to supply the world. It's just a matter of distribution. Now, some of us are keepers, and I gotta admit, I'm one of those. I, I know Brenly will attest to that. It's a good thing, because we're a good balance for one another. But you know, I keep, I believe, in part, at least, in my defense, <laughs> I keep in part for a conscious reason, for a frugal reason. Because I think if I keep that temporarily, and I have the space for that thing, that I won't, it won't land up, end up in a landfill, and I won't buy something else to, to fill that need. And so it, that's part of my thinking. But it's important that we also continue to revisit ourselves, our thinking, and, and why, why we keep or why we store up. Because I really want to weed out the greed wherever it is and open up the channels for generosity. And I think you probably do too. So that's really what we're looking at in this experience today together to look at what we're hanging on to and then asking ourselves, how does this serve? Or as Marie Kondo would say, does it spark joy? And then thinking about who could it serve and releasing it in gratitude. That's a really just a beautiful process that brings our spirituality into our physicality and allows us to open up those channels and to move toward generosity and away from greed. I recently heard a radio interview with a journalist who is in the, works in the garment industry. And he said that on average, Americans buy 85 garments a year. And then he was, you know, juxtaposing that against the fast fashion industry and how often those items are made by typically young girls working in countries such as Bangladesh, maybe about 16 hours a day, for about half the living wage that they really need to, to live, you know, just even to supply their basic needs. And they often work in unsafe conditions 
And on top of it all, there is this dump of chemicals that goes on devastating our environment. So when we know all of that, suddenly that $10 shirt isn't such a great deal. It costs a lot more than that. And when we become aware of the cost of things, the bigger picture, the universal cost of things, then we can't really go back. <laughs> I hate to break it to you if that's new news for you, because I know I have sort of put the brakes on, on learning about some of these things. But once we know, once we know, there's other ways and there's another path that can serve everyone. So what is the source and the cost of what we buy? With a little effort, we can find out. We have a lot of power to make change through our purchasing power, through our conscious choices that we can make. And so when we do, we can ask ourselves questions like, what is essential? What is sufficient? And what is aligning with my values? And that can help guide the way to everything that we, we do and certainly the ways that we shop. I mean, certainly we can purchase less, but we can also purchase in a more conscious way from those who are working it, it, to be sustainable. Um, those, and there are plenty of companies that are doing that, a lot more than I even ever realized as I began to just do a very quick search. One of the companies that came up is thegoodtrade.com where they list 36 different ethical clothing companies that you can buy from and a bunch of beauty products and other things like that. And I'm proud to say that a lot of those actually are in California. So there's a lot that we can do about just shifting our behaviors, our actions, to move ourselves into that beautiful quality of spirit that is called generosity. So what is essential? I think it's the question of our times. It's a question of this time, this exact time in our planetary history, to keep in the forefront of our minds what is essential. Because as we keep in the forefront of our minds, the industries, the things in our world that are essential, the things in our lives that are essential for our own personal well-being, they all align. And then we can begin to really work in those areas to open things up for the kind of world, the kind of flow that we want to live in. So what is essential? Well, the obvious ones, right? Food and water and clothing and shelter. And there's also some human essentials, I think, that we all are aware of needing. Connection. We're social beings. And we sure could use some kindness. I think that I'm going to call that essential. Kindness. And so if we keep those things in the forefront of our minds, then we can flip this process, the idea of not only keeping them in the forefront of our minds, but also keeping the idea of sharing that there's plenty for all, that we can flip this coin from greed to generosity. Brene Brown, the researcher, defines generosity in a way that really hits upon those last couple that I mentioned, things like connection and kindness. She says that generosity, or her definition of generosity, is the ability to extend the most generous interpretation of somebody's actions and words and their own intentions. So if we are able to extend the most generous interpretation of somebody's intentions, words, and actions, we are offering a kind of generosity. We are offering a kind of spaciousness. It's almost bordering on forgiveness. And so it's that kind of open spaced way that we offer kindness to one another. So when we do make a mistake, it doesn't become this overblown deal. It's just something that we can course correct with ease. And if we've got somebody who's holding that kind of generous space for us, it's a lot easier for us to flow back in to alignment with spirit in the way that I think we all are wired to be in truth. We can also, you know, rely on the spirit within us because the, the divine in us knows what is essential. There is an innate understanding of what is essential. And so it is through that that we can share freely by knowing that. That's what spirit does, right? Spirit just flows. It shares freely. It's a source that keeps on giving. And so when we tap that source within us, when we tap that ability to be generous, it just flows with a sense of ease. And then we realize, ah, this is how I'm meant to be. This is how things click. This is how things work. 
And then that old way of being, just that clingy old way of being, that storing up, it doesn't have a purpose anymore. We realize then, we've overcome those false myths, those false beliefs that, that there's not enough. There's plenty. It's just a matter of getting it out there and sharing it, practicing generosity. So it's just a matter of clearing the old baggage, really, so that we can free the truth, that we can free the spirit. I remember years ago, I was in a prosperity workshop and I just had this big aha. You know, it seems so simple sometimes when you talk about it in hindsight, but those unconscious beliefs can be really stubborn. (laughs) And so what I recognized is that I had this idea that to be wealthy was equated somehow with greed. And so I didn't, I, I was blocking my own prosperity because I had this idea this unconscious belief. But as, as I recognized it and had this aha and then went through this exercise of, of imagining myself really wealthy, what arose as I got out of my own way and was able to overcome a little bit of that unconscious belief once the light of day was hitting it, then what I felt when I was imagining and feeling myself as a very, gen- as a very wealthy person was, was the, the quality of generosity arising. And so my affirmation then became, certainly my financial um, prosperity affirmation became, I am wealthy and generous. The two together, not separated. I'm wealthy and generous because then there was a recognition that the more I have, the more opportunities I have to give in bigger ways. Proverbs puts the giving first. Proverbs says, give freely and become more wealthy. Be stingy and lose everything. So, Lynn Twist shares a, Lynn Twist is an author, uh, I've referred to her before, she's the author of The Soul of Money. What I really like about her work is she talks about prosperity in terms of sufficiency and generosity, not just abundance for abundance sake, but what do you do with it? And this, this belief system that says there is enough, I am enough and therefore I can give freely without fear. So she shares that um, she, in in the beginnings of her um, transformation, I guess you could say her awakening, she and her husband had a lot, a lot of money. And she said they lived this life of leisure and comfort, but it just began to feel a bit empty for her. She was longing for a sense of meaning and contribution. And so she began to look at ways that she could change her lifestyle and, and, and use her resources for good and, and genuine service and in generosity. And that led her to uh, have a call from the Amazon. And in that call from the Amazon, something called the Pachamama Alliance was co-founded by Lynn and others. So I want to share this video from the Pachamama Alliance. We can take a a moment to see a little bit about the origins and, and what it's about. Let's take a look. These are the Atuar people, an ancient dream culture still living in harmony with their ancestral land nearly five million acres of pristine tropical rainforest in Ecuador and Peru. Our people lived here undisturbed for thousands of years. Then our elders and shaman began to receive visions from our ancestors, warning that a menace was coming toward our people. We soon saw that danger, the destruction brought by oil companies to our neighbors to the north. It is Achuar tradition that we do not run from danger, but go towards it. So we reached out to seek support from people in the outside world. In 1995, a call issued forth from the heart of the natural world that was heard thousands of miles away by a small group of people in the modern world. That summer, in a remote village in the rainforest, these two worlds came together and the Pachamama Alliance was born. 
Although we were called by the elders and shamans of the Achuar, something deeper had called us there, and we realized it was the spirit of life itself, the spirit of Mother Earth, what the indigenous people call Pachamama. The Achuar appreciated that the Pachamama Alliance was working shoulder to shoulder with them to protect their land and culture. But they knew that this work in the rainforest was not enough. From the very beginning, we recognized that the real threats to our land came not from the oil companies, but from the outside world itself. It is the modern world's dream of always wanting more and more that is causing the destruction of the forests. So we told our partners that to protect our lands permanently, they would need to work in their part of the world as well and change the dream that is threatening the rainforest and the future of all life. And so the Pachamama Alliance boldly committed itself to a twofold mission to preserve the land and culture of the Amazon rainforest and to change the dream of the modern world. And that is the dream, to change the dream of the modern world. That's our work. And we do that by transforming our mentality and our approach, just by making a shift. Where there is greed, where there is this idea that more is better, this myth that more is better, and this exclusive idea on me and mine, we can shift instead to a mentality that underpins generosity, that says there's plenty, there's more than enough for everyone, and that we can share freely from that place. And you know, there's always that understanding that from, from the physical to the spiritual, that if we're believing that there's not enough, there's usually an underpinning that we're not enough. And so there is that innate sense of, of worthiness that comes with this work as well. So, it, by the way, uh, the Pachamama Alliance was able, with the Achuar people, was able to um, secure for them and with them 1.8 million acres of the rainforest that they have full title to now. So we can rest easy that at least 1.8 million acres of the rainforest, the lungs of our planet, are being cared for by good stewards who have the greater good in mind for many, many generations to come, at least seven. So, you know, sometimes it takes the purity of a child to remind us of our generosity. There's a story in Soul Food by Jack Hornfield and Christina Feldman. It's set in Illinois. There's a young family, an eight-year-old daughter and a six-year-old son, and the girl contracts this rare blood disease and they are looking for a donor, a blood donor that will match for her and they're, you know, they got the all call out and, and nothing is coming in and she's getting weaker. And they realize that her six-year-old little brother actually is a match. And so the mother and the minister and the doctor sit down with the six-year-old boy and they ask him if he'd be willing to contribute his blood to save his sister's life. He says he has to think about it. And several days go by before he comes to his mother and says, I've made my decision. I will do this. And so this brave little boy and his, and his sister go to the hospital with the doctor. And the doctor sets it up in a way that's really um, friendly for them and helpful for them to see what's happening. So they have their two cots together. And he takes a half a pint of blood from the, the boy. And he says, now, he, he wants him to see the effects, which are pretty immediate, of putting that blood into his sister. And so you could see the color starts to flush in her cheeks, and she starts to look a whole lot healthier just from that simple transfusion. Then the boy calls to the doctor, and he says, come here. And he wants to say this in secret, and so he whispers to the doctor, how long before I die? You see, in his literal mind, he thought 
that giving blood to his sister to save her life was giving his life. Now that is amazing generosity. It doesn't really get any bigger than that or any purer than that. And the truth is, that's how we're wired. That's how we come in or that's how we've been created. To be that generous, to be that caring, to be that loving, because we are inseparable from the divine. We just have forgotten. The Wendigo has forgotten. The Wendigo has forgotten who they are. The Wendigo has forgotten the way of the divine. And it is truly our work to dream a new world, to dream a, a different dream for the modern world, one that is marked by this divine quality of generosity and that erases and lets go and dissolves greed. So that dark side of humanity that is the Wendigo is brightened by the light that you bring when you shift yourself into generosity. And we can do that. We can remember who we are again by some simple acts that we've talked about today, by shifting the way that we think, by shifting the way that we shop, by shifting the way that we act. And to recognize that those simple acts, those $20 purchases, or the ways that we treat the people around us can shift everything on this planet. And so as we weed out the greed and we open up the space for generosity to come in, we do that by these, these actions. Staying present too to the opportunities that come right before us in any given moment to share our good, to be of generous service. And choosing over and over again long-term fulfillment for the good of all over short-term gratification for our own selfish and immediate needs. It makes a huge difference, every small act. So as we do these things, we become, as Gandhi once said, the change we wish to see in our world. And as we do these things, we can make conscious and as we make conscious choices in particular, we can transform greed, that deadly sin of greed, into the living virtue of generosity. So let's know this together. Let's speak it together and affirm it in our hearts and move through the next week really steeped in this teaching of shifting this vice into a virtue. Together, I invite you to say this affirmation and maybe to work with this affirmation throughout the week in helping remind you. Let's say it together. Through my conscious choices, I transform greed into generosity. And so it is. Thank you for listening today.